Hi and welcome back to AB 474 Indoor Environmental Control. This is the second part of our section on um, comfort and health and we're going to focus this uh, part on indoor air quality so we're going to be looking at things that are um, affecting our occupant environment interactions that are related to contaminants. Um, again, what's in your book is very uh, human-centric, so it's focused on humans, but we uh, uh, will draw a little bit on animals as well, and if you're, uh, for example, working with plants, this part is really uh, a significant uh, piece of what you should consider because you're going to be very interested in gas exchange with the environment. Um, same thing if you're working with microorganisms or something other than plants and animals, um, you're going to be very interested in the exchange of uh, gases and byproducts with your environment as you're thinking about environmental control. Um, but let's shift back to our, our human thoughts and, and we'll cover a little bit of what's in our book. Um, for humans, this is a, a significant challenge and a significant problem. Um, now the biggest reason has to do with productivity losses. So most of our environmental control systems are based on temperature. That's both for humans and for animals. So by neglecting these other um, uh, contaminants in our environmental control design and operation, we're losing estimated billions of dollars annually uh, due to indoor air quality problems. and this can be related to productivity losses, it can be related to health problems that are resulting from uh, environmental control issues, and um, there are a lot of um, uh, contaminants we should be considering that have uh, detrimental effects on animals uh, and humans, that includes humans. So um, the biggest one that we should be considering um, in pretty much every environment that we have an animal is CO2 because CO2 is produced as a, um, a byproduct uh, of metabolism and the biggest impact it has is it causes sleepiness. So if you're in a setting like a classroom, for example, and there's insufficient fresh air coming in or ventilation air coming in, then your carbon dioxide concentrations are going to be rising because all the occupants are contributing CO2 to the environment and um, the result is a huge loss in productivity uh, as, as people become sleepy. So carbon monoxide, even at levels that are not deadly, uh, still can cause headaches. Um, lack of focus. Then we have some combustion gases that we should be considering uh, mostly in industrial settings. So SOx and NOx and these have significant health impacts. In our homes especially we've uh, more recently, not random, radon. Uh, so radon is a gas that comes from the earth uh, and if we don't have sufficient ventilation in our homes, which we um, uh, typically we don't bring in fresh air to our homes um, and so uh, there are a number of, of cases known, many cases known, uh, where radon has um, uh, built up within residential settings because there's not sufficient fresh air coming in and we've uh, our construction over time has become better and better at not being leaky so um, in the past residential construction uh, was leaky enough that enough fresh air came in to dilute concentrations uh, of radon coming into homes but as our construction has become tighter and tighter and our ventilation systems don't accommodate uh, any fresh ventilation air coming in, we have seen increases of radon in homes. And it's a colorless, odor, odorless gas um, that is uh, radioactive. And that's kind of a big deal uh, because we know that radioactive things cause cancer. And radon in homes has been linked to development of cancer in, um, in people. Um, so there are very simple solutions to that, but we have to recognize it's a problem before we can take those solutions. Uh, volatile organic compounds, again this is primarily in uh, more industrial settings, uh, but not necessarily limited to just industrial settings. And this is uh, volatilized from, uh, primarily from glues associated with production and manufacturing.
I apologize for my handwriting today. I am kind of messy, but hopefully you can follow along. Um, and then other particulates. When we think of particulates, we're typically primarily thinking of dust, um, but some of the more dangerous particulates uh, might be bacterias, um, might be molds, and certainly include dust as well. Um, a lot of our, a lot of potential gases in many cases uh, we're exposed to because they adhere to dust and then we breathe the dust in. Uh, so then it comes into direct contact with our lung tissue. Um, and then one that we are, in, depending on the state that you live in, ETS. Uh, there's been a lot of action taken against ETS. Environmental tobacco smoke. So in, in many states uh, and in all federal buildings, it's now prohibited to smoke within the building um, and in many cases even within so many feet of, of the door. So um, this is one that has had a lot of public awareness uh, in, in recent years. <clears throat> so those are contaminants. And then the other uh, issue of indoor environmental uh, quality, indoor air quality that we um, need to consider is humidity. So let's talk for a few minutes about controlling humidity. So why are we interested in controlling humidity? Um, so you may think it's just moisture. It's just moisture in the air and that's a good thing. And yes, enough moisture is important because if there's too little, we're just we're, uh, uh, uncomfortable. So comfort is one reason why we consider uh, humidity and if it's too low we can have respiratory drying <coughs> I feel like that's what I have a little bit of right now so you may hear me coughing a little bit if too low um, which can make our respiratory system uh, irritated and so it can be comfort it also can um, uh, if we're too dry too long can um, cause distress on our respiratory system and potentially make us more susceptible to respiratory infection um, and if uh, if we have too much moisture in the air, we might feel um, uh, warm because of the extra moisture in the air, but there's a bigger problem because too much moisture in the air can result in promotion of mold. And one of the big challenges that we have uh, become aware of, again, in recent years is black mold and the uh, impacts of that on our respiratory health. Um, and in addition to this promotion of mold, um, this, the excess of moisture can also result in uh, promotion of certain pests, mites, and other bacteria. Our ideal humidity, somewhere around 50%. There's a pretty good margin of error on that 50%, but our target in environmental control is typically a relative humidity of 50%. Um, in general, when we're talking about moisture, we want to <coughs> remove it whenever uh, we're in summer or whenever we're in warm conditions. And that usually goes along with when we're doing a cooling process. And if you think in terms of um, uh, our psychrometric properties, warmer air tends to hold more moisture. Um, so look at your psychrometric properties to convince yourself of that. Self of that. But warmer air tends to have the capacity, more capacity to hold more moisture. So moisture is more of a problem in warmer conditions. And in uh, colder conditions, we typically want to add moisture. Or when we're looking at heating processes. So when we talked about the psychrometric processes and we said cooling with dehumidification or heating with humidification, that's because of this. Typically we're wanting to remove moisture when we're cooling and typically we're wanting to add moisture when we're heating. 
Um, rarely do we want to cool and humidify, or rarely do we want to heat and dehumidify. Um, if you notice the process of heating, uh, if we're doing sensible heating, it's a natural dehumidification process in terms of the relative humidity. So when we heat the air by sensible heating, we are already reducing the relative humidity just as a part of that process. <clears throat> so we probably want to add back some of the moisture so that it doesn't feel as dry. All right, so how? How do we add or remove moisture? Um, if it's not a part of the cooling with dehumidification or the heating with humidification, um, so that's one option. So if we want to remove moisture, we can look at our psychometric processes and see where are the logical ways to do it. So cooling with dehumidification is one option. Uh, we also identified um, that we can use a desiccant. So those are our two primary ways to remove moisture. So cooling with dehumidification or a desiccant drying. Um, here, we want to add moisture. Um, so if we're doing a heating with humidification, usually that's a steam injection as we saw in the psychometric processes section or evaporative cooling. And those are our primary ways to add moisture. <coughs> and if we want to um, control contaminants, so if we go back up to our um, list of how we control contaminants, there are uh, some primary methods that we use, four primary methods that we use to control contaminants. So the easiest thing that we can do to control our contaminants is to never put them in the environment to begin with. Um, we call that source elimination. So if we can find a way to keep them from ever going into our environment, then that is the um, uh, the way to avoid a problem. Um, I would say it's the easiest. It's not always the easiest thing to do, but in many cases it's the easiest thing to do. So prevent the problem before it becomes a problem. Um, but in cases where we can't avoid it, we cannot uh, uh, remove it from the source, then we have other ways uh, in order to control the contaminants. Um, we've already in the past alluded to air cleaning as one way to do it, and that can be uh, done by filtering the particles out of the airstream. So that's for particulates. Um, we might uh, filter or we have other methods that we can use for gas removal, so like chemical neutralization or uh, some way of, of removing the gas from the environment. So air cleaning, so essentially there's a contaminant in the air and we find a way to take it out. Um, we can also employ what's called space air distribution, which is essentially um, uh, acknowledging that things are in the environment but that we are very actively controlling their pattern of movement and where they go. So for example, um, Let's think about a hospital clean room or um, an electronics uh, uh, production room. Um, and typically these spaces are kind of an all-in, all-out. There's one place that's an inlet and one place that's an outlet. Um, and we control the ventilation in the room so it's a very laminar flow. Um, and then we control the movement of things in the room so that where the um, source is, is upwind, if you will, from uh, uh, from primarily the exhaust, and anything we don't want to come into contact with that source, we put uh, we don't put downwind. Okay, so we make sure that things that need to stay away from the contaminant are upwind of the source of generation of the contaminant, and then our ventilation air uh, carries it uh, directly to the exhaust. Um, so space air distribution, we can think about how we manipulate the movement of the air to control um, the contaminant, where it goes, and what it comes into contact with. 
And then uh, ventilation is one of our uh, key ways of controlling contaminants. So we essentially bring in outdoor or fresh or clean. It doesn't necessarily have to come from outside, but it just typically does. Um, outdoor, we'll say clean air. So it could be air that's been cleaned that we then come in and use for dilution. Um, outdoor or clean air in order to dilute the concentration within our uh, control space. Uh, so these are our pharma four primary ways of uh, controlling contaminants, so controlling gases, controlling particulates. Um, and as we think about uh, controlling them, uh, especially when we talk about ventilation, you may hear the phrase, air changes per hour. And this is one way that we measure ventilation, air changes per hour. It's abbreviated ACH, and it is the relationship between uh, infiltration or incoming air. So it could be intentionally incoming air or it could be accidental incoming air. And when we get to our um, chapter where we're going to start looking at um, energy balances and when we talk about structures and things, we'll talk about uh, what we mean by different types of infiltration and how to estimate them. Um, but in this equation, air changes per hour is any air that's coming in, which is called infiltration here. Um, in most of our intentional uh, ventilation, so if we're actively ventilating a space, we typically call that Q. Um, so this I would include Q, and it would also include any um, unintentional air coming in as well. Um, and then this is the volume of our space. So this is the infiltration to the space, and this is the volume of the space, so how big the, the space is. And our units on air changes per hour, um, one over hour, so the one air change per hour, uh, and then some number because of so many air changes per hour. All right. So we, um, <clears throat> at this point, have introduced that um, uh, contaminants can cause problems. How do we know how much is too much of a contaminant in our space? How do we know where to set our limits? So we talked about in the last part about setting our limits for temperature based on either thermoneutral conditions or comfort conditions. So with air quality, um, especially for humans, um, our limits, uh, we, we typically rely on um, safety information to set our limits. Um, so groups like the ACGIH, I'll write that out in just a minute, but um, government industrial hygienists essentially um, set recommendations as well as um, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, which is a similar um, Occupational Safety and Health group, ASHRAE has recommendations. Um, those are all for humans and they're typically set uh, based on what happens to a human who's exposed to that environment. And so recommendations for humans tend to show up as um, uh, time-weighted averages, which are based on a workday, so based on an eight-hour workday, or uh, what we call uh, STEL, or short-term exposure limits. And these are the very extreme cases where um, essentially being within that environment at that condition is life-threatening. 15 minutes. There we go. So a, a short-term exposure is a 15-minute exposure. And um, these limits are looking at um, health impacts. So these are sort of the upper extreme limits that you would want anyone to be exposed to in order to um, prevent long-term uh, health problems or death which is an important one. Um, so CO2, for example, 5,000 parts per million uh, averaged over eight hours is the recommended limit for um, CO2 exposure in humans. Just to put that in a little bit of context, um, we recommend in spaces, for example, I was talking about a, a, a classroom and people becoming sleepy. So we try to set our limits for uh, environmental control to two to three thousand parts per million because that's the point at which people start getting sleepy and losing focus. 
um, you know, we'd, we'd like to limit it to 2,000 or 2,500 uh, so that people can maintain proper focus. So up to 5,000 is uh, more about long-term respiratory health problems uh, after being exposed to this for eight-hour workdays, repeated eight-hour workdays. Um, this short-term exposure limit, so if I sat at two to 3,000 parts per million, people begin to lose focus and start to become sleepy. 30,000 parts per million is the, the limit at which people begin to lose consciousness, um, at which enough oxygen is being displaced that your brain is not functioning as it should in order for you to um, escape the situation as needed. Um, so these short-term exposure limits um, really should not factor much into a, a design of a, an ongoing situation, but these are more about uh, emergency conditions. So if you are designing a, a, a system where you're worried about getting into an emergency situation, you may look at those. But for the most part, you're going to look at these, and you're probably not going to do your design to allow things to come up to this level. But these are the recommendations that we have for safety conditions. Ammonia, 25 parts per million and 35 parts per million. There's not too much difference, uh, not, not very much difference between those two. Um, PPM is a unit that you may or may not have seen before. This is parts per million. So one partic particle of this compound for every million particles. And for kind of reference, uh, our background CO2 concentrations tend to be in the 350 parts per million range. So if you just walk outside or the fresh air that you're bringing in, tend to be in the 300 to 350 range. Um, uh, ammonia concentration, hydrogen sulfide, they tend to be zero uh, unless you have a source of generation for them. And you can look up a number of other contaminants uh, in, in the materials that are put out by these agencies. So this table specifically came from this ACGIH, and this is the American Council, American for Government Industrial Hygienists. Um, and again, just to kind of re reiterate, these are set for humans, may or may not be applicable to other animals, and these are uh, designed to be occupational standards, so these are not standards for residential conditions. These are set more about keeping the work workplace safe, but we can use them as a reference to help inform uh, our decisions uh, in other applications because this is the, the best information that we have to use. Um, as I mentioned, there are a number of other entities that uh, set this kind of standard as well. It's kind of, um, I say standard, though it's not a true standard. It's more of a recommendation. Recom and these are examples, so you'll probably find uh, a number of uh, others. This isn't a comprehensive list. These are some examples. So we said OSHA and NIOSH, which are both government supported. Um, ASHRAE, which is our professional organization in heating, refrigeration, and air conditioning. Um, in your book, Table 4 1 gives some uh, guidelines that you might take a look at. And for animals, we have similar types of uh, information. These things might come from. Uh, uh, groups like <clears throat> UEP, which is a um, producer-based organization, uh, Farm Animal Welfare Council, which is a government organization in the United Kingdom, um, ALAC, uh, Lab Animal uh, Professional Group. So depending on your application, uh, you can likely find at least some information about uh, recommendations or uh, setting limits. And uh, just to <clears throat> summarize, you know, what do we use as our rules of thumb in animal housing? It looks a lot like what we use for our rules of thumb in human housing and human environments. Uh, typically, we like to see our CO2 less than 2,000 parts per million, maybe up to 2,500, uh, depending on the situation and uh, the difference between, for example, um, 
upgrading all of our equipment to the next level up. You know, sometimes we might decide to make an exception that 2500 is acceptable based on uh, cost and operation. Uh, ammonia for animal housing, we typically say 20 parts per million, um, though that varies a lot depending on who you ask and uh, depending on the production system, even 20 parts per million can be very difficult to, to control and maintain uh, under all conditions. Let's work through, um, well first let's think a little bit about uh, continuing on with the, the human example and how we might think about uh, a ventilation approach. We've looked at this before uh, in the very, at the very beginning of this class where we were thinking out about how we ventilate a space. And this is a good time maybe to go back and <clears throat> revisit that and think about uh, ventilating a space and um, bringing some air back, mixing it in with some outdoor air, conditioning that air and supplying a space um, and sort of tie in some of our new concepts. So let's see. And we're going to put my art skills to the test and uh, I like that. I don't know that I'm very good at it but I like a challenge. So this is going to be our uh, supply air system into a space. So we're going to call it a space. This is the space that we want to control. Uh, it could be a room, it could be um, a set of rooms, but we're controlling some space. This is the supply air going into that space and this is the return air coming out of that space. So we bring back some of that air and we're going to exhaust some of that air to the outdoors. Okay, So this is going to be some of the air gets exhausted, some of it gets uh, returned, let's see, and I'm going to bring in some fresh air. Okay, so make sure we have our scenario set up correctly. All right, so um, we have uh, a space that's conditioned. It's at, I say it's at our 21 degrees Celsius, 50% relative humidity. That's our target here. We're returning some of that, sending some of it outside. We're returning some of it back into our system. <coughs> and we're mixing it with some outdoor air. and then we may choose to do some kind of cleaning on the air. We could choose to do the cleaning before we mix it or we could choose to do it after. <coughs> and then we're probably going to condition it thermally as well. And so within this air handler we might have our heating unit um, <coughs> cooler dehumidifier humidifier um, in order to condition the air and then send it back to the space. Um, I mentioned a, a term called infiltration. <coughs> Typically when we talk about infiltration we're talking about air that comes in that's not intended and that air changes per hour. It could be this supply air coming in or it could be um, the air that's leaking into our space that's unintended. We can likewise also have exfiltration. So as we're doing our design, it's important to um, think about how this system all puts together. And as we continue through the chapters, we'll look more at exfil infiltration, exfiltration, what causes it, how to quantify it. Um, but so far, the pieces that we've talked about in, in this um, uh, up to this point, we've talked about the psychometric properties and processes in order to manipulate the air, um, and now we've talked a little bit about uh, thinking about this control space and what's happening inside this control space. And our, 
I think the next thing that we'll we'll do is move on and consider um, an example of that control space. And let's do an example um, that's not humans so that we can see a little something else. Um, but we'll start with this e equation 4, 5 from your text. And it's thinking about uh, specifically how we're ventilating spaces. So we're thinking about that control space. Um, in this equation, the little e stands for entering as opposed to exhaust, which can be confusing. Um, and S stands for space, which would be which would have the same conditions as what's being exhausted. That is very important to note that um, the, what their subscripts mean. Uh, I'm accustomed to seeing e being exhaust, um, so in this case, it's entering. Um, and I'm used to S being supply. And you can see from our figure above that that essentially reverses the equation entirely. Uh, if you look at this as S versus E uh, uh, or, or vice versa. So the equation in your book, uh, the little E stands for entering uh, and the little S stands for space as opposed to supply and exhaust, which is more commonly seen. All right, so when we talk about Q, we're talking about uh, our ventilation rate or the flow rate of air moving through the space. N is anything that's generated in the space. Generated. And so the same thing, this is going to be a ventilation. And this is the concentration. These C's are concentrations of whatever contaminant we're looking at. Um, and so essentially, what's coming in plus what's generated equals what's going out. Okay? So let's look at that well, with a picture. Uh, we're going to call that our indoor air quality balance. Uh, and that's our equation. Um, and uh, since we're on this theme of testing my art skills, let's keep going with that and uh, we'll see how things come out. I'm going to attempt to uh, let you guys take a little guess while I'm drawing as I draw. And uh, it's just too bad that I can't hear your guesses and your laughter. And hopefully by now you're getting an idea of what I'm drawing. And very, very soon, you'll know what it is, I hope. And I hope that I don't have any hate mail from piggies that shows up at my door later uh, for my terrible art skills. This is our uh, brief artistic interlude before we get back to our very engineering stuff. Um, if you need brief interludes in your homeworks or exams, I am uh, very encouraging and uh, love to see your, your artwork and your cartoons and your, uh, your thoughts. So hopefully that looks a little bit like a piggy. Uh, let's put our piggy on the ground here. All right, hopefully this looks like a piggy in a space. It's a pretty terrible piggy. Um, but he's generating some stuff in this space. That's the important part. So both he and his feces are generating some gases um, at some rate that we're going to call m dot gen, or in the equation above, n. Um, oh, there's supposed to be a dot on that n. So there should be an n. Um, and he is inside of a controlled environment. There we go. And within his controlled environment, we have some uh, ventilation air coming in that's at some initial concentration or some entering concentration. Or if you'd rather see, uh, in terms of volumetric, uh, some volume of air coming in uh, with a concentration. Uh, and some air going out, or the same thing, it can be going out as either a mass or a 
um, for it. All right, so what kind of things might this gen be in terms of animal housing? So we talked about um, some of the human recommendations. Let's just quickly introduce for those who are not as familiar um, within animal housing, what are some of the gases that we're interested in, some of the contaminants we're interested in. So let me make a note, this is not in your HVAC text, so we're kind of going off script for a little bit. Um, so ammonia, we might see in animal housing. Methane, we might see in animal housing. Hydrogen sulfide, uh, SF6, we typically don't see very, very much of, but we use it sometimes as a tracer gas. Um, so why are we interested in these gases? Manure gases. So most of the gases that we see uh, in animal houses um, are related to um, gases coming from the feces inside the controlled environment. So when we see things like methane or ammonia or hydrogen sulfide in, in human environments, unless it's related to agriculture or farming animals, usually we're seeing them from industrial processes. Um, in the case of animal housing, we are seeing them uh, as products of uh, the manure in the environment. So the concerns that we have that stem from these gases in the environment uh, relate to the health of both the animals and the workers. So there is a human concern. Um, it looks a little different than, <coughs> than the animal concern uh, because the animals are in that environment 24 hours a day, every day, and our workers are typically working um, you know, a, a, a work day. <coughs> we also may be interested in the gases that are coming uh, off out of animal housing due to environmental concerns. So environmental air quality and pollution. Um, typical things we see in terms of uh, treatment or uh, mitigation of gases in animal environments. Uh, the primary mode that we use in animal production or animal housing is ventilation in order to dilute. We also um, uh, see a lot of, of action and consideration based on uh, things that, that we do with the diet so we can add things to the environment um, control the environment or con add things to the diet or control the environment control the diet <laughs> sorry I'm misspeaking so we can add things to the diet or we can control the di diet specifically uh, to uh, have an impact on uh, what's coming out so both uh, metabolic processes metabolic byproducts from the animal and also what happens to the manure after it's excreted we can have an impact on gases depending on what we're doing with that, the feces, with the manure after um, it's excreted. So how we're storing it, how we're treating it, we can also add things to it. So are we storing it in wet form? Are we trying to dry it? Are we uh, keeping it in the house? How long are we keeping it in the house? Are we land applying it? Are we turning it into another product? So what we do with it after it's excreted can have an impact on the gases, where they go, where they accumulate, um, and their concentrations. And there are also methods of biofiltration in order to neutralize the gases. Um, one thought process and approach to um, manure in general, uh, which has positive uh, impacts on environmental control, is uh, to preserve the nutrients uh, to make it a value-added product. And to some degree, most animal feces becomes uh, a, uh, a source of fertilize, but the extent to which these uh, efforts are taken to preserve the nutrients uh, really makes a difference in the impact on the environmental control. Um, there are a number of things you can do to uh, to, to keep, so, so any gases that are generated are a movement of 
uh, some compound within it to volatilization to the air and once it's in the air it's not um, not as useful as a, uh, a fertilized. So you can take steps that preserve it in uh, either the solid or liquid form, make it more useful, more value added um, as, a, a, uh, as a product. And that has positive implications on environmental control because it's not going into the air. All right, so let's think for a few minutes about um, how do we calculate, how do we estimate generation? And we are gonna stick with um, CO2 uh, for our calculations. Uh, primarily because we know a lot about it and it is one of um, I would say the um, we have the best information about predicting and controlling it so because it's related to metabolic activity and we understand a lot about metabolism uh, where it comes from we have a pretty solid relationship uh, for how to estimate the production or the generation of CO2. So as a rule, we have one liter of CO2 produced for 24,600 joules of total heat production. Okay, Whenever we are discussing uh, CO2, we typically uh, understand our gas in the air in parts per million as I mentioned earlier this ppm that we see should we don't always use it have a small subscript V behind it because when we're talking about parts per million we're almost always talking about a concentration on a volume basis okay so one parts per million is one uh, meters is interpreted as one meters cube of gas for 1 times 10 to the 6 meters cubed of air. So one particle of gas for every <clears throat> million particles of air on a volume basis. Okay. Alright, so let's work through an example using CO2 and if we want to talk about um, uh, our contaminants in gas gaseous form, we typically say atmospheric CO2, or atmospheric ammonia. Um, and that just is confirming the state that it's in a gaseous state. So as I said, when we work with CO2, um, we usually say our ambient condition, or that's our condition of our um, air that we're bringing in from the outside, what we're using as our fresh air. Uh, I said 3 to 350, 345 is a good number to use, 360. Um, that number is kind of nudging upward uh, as our uh, CO2 levels increase. Um, but as we uh, are working in environmental control, any estimate in that range is, is going to be sufficient. So 345 meters cubed of CO2 per 1 times 10 to the 6 meters cubed of air is 0 0.000345 meters cubed CO2 per meters cubed of air. So this is all saying the same thing. 345 parts per million, our ambient condition, is the same as 345 divided by 1 times 10 to the 6 uh, meters cubed of CO2 per meters cubed of air, and you can expand that out uh, and move the decimal over. <clears throat> now let's um, go back and revisit our um, ideal gas conditions again. So back to chemistry for just a few minutes, again, so that we think a little bit about working with uh, CO2 in air. All right. PV equals nRT. We've seen this before already. Um, molecular masses for CO2 and air. 4.01 uh, molecular mass of CO2. And then our gas constants. And now 
already looked at where our gas constant for air comes from in the earlier section, and our density <clears throat> at 300 Kelvin. So that's kind of close to our room temperature, right? 1.8 kilograms per meters cubed. Okay. Um, let's see, what else do we need in here? Let's apply for CO2, our gas, gas law. So P times V of CO2 equals N of CO2, gas constant of CO2, that's our temperature. And then similar relationship for air. We have an assumption. So our assumption is our gases are perfectly mixed. And they're at the same pressure and temperature when they're mixed. Okay. <coughs> so our density is the amount we have divided by the volume. So we can just rearrange our equation a little bit and end up with the relationship uh, between temperature and pressure for air is the same as the relationship between temperature and pressure for CO2. And then we can uh, further take this pressure CO2 And then we can solve this put that all together and look at our concentration of our CO2 as the relationship between how much CO2 we have versus how much air we have. Okay, and then we're just going to rearrange again to end up with uh, this relationship between okay and we have one more iteration to get to the important number that we need um, so we need to know about this relationship between um, CO2 and air okay and if we go one more iteration with this, you're going to want to remember this part and then come back and take a look at it after we work our next example problem. 1.519 is our coefficient for our relationship between volume of CO2 and volume of air. Okay, So it probably doesn't mean much right now, but it's going to. You're going to understand why you need it after we work the next example problem. Okay. <coughs> okay, here we go. So we are given 360 pigs. They are 60 kilograms each and we are asked to find the ventilation that's required to stay below that recommendation I showed you earlier, this time weighted average of 5,000 parts per million of CO2. I would never in the real world ask you to keep it at this level. I would actually ask you much lower, but this essentially is telling you your absolute minimum ventilation for your system. OK? 
okay? Absolute minimum ventilation for your system if you had um, no other fans running. So when would that be uh, an important situation to know? Um, if you had an extreme cold event, an extreme cold event that um, you really didn't want to bring in any more cold air than you absolutely had to because you're balancing the challenge of thermal conditions and air quality. Um, you still need to bring in some ventilation air. You have to or else your animals are going to suffer and your people going into the environment are going to suffer. Um, another example of when that might be the case, if you have a power outage, you have to have a backup plan for the absolute minimum fresh air you're going to bring in in order to keep your animals alive and keep your people going into that environment alive. Um, so that's what this calculation is for. What is the absolute emergency situation where you need to make sure that you have some ventilation running, um, either it's an extreme cold event that's a limited event or a power outage and you need to know your contingency plan if there's going to be a power outage knowing that you don't know how long before the power comes back on. So this isn't a 15 minute situation, this is um, a, an extended period of time that you have to prepare a contingency plan for so that your animals and your humans aren't suffering, okay? All right, so how do we do this? We are going to do a mass balance for CO2. So mass of air, times the concentration of CO2 tells you how much concentration is uh, coming in. You need to think about how much is generated. And that is equivalent to, some of those is equivalent to the amount that's leaving. Okay, and I'm going to say 1 and 2 instead of worrying with the E and the S because to me that's way confusing. All right. So how much is generated? That is an unknown and we need to figure that out. We can use our relationship of CO2 to energy. So this is how much CO2 is generated. One liter for every 24,600 joules in total heat production. We need to know how much total heat is produced in order to use this equation and determine how much CO2 is generated. So, we can determine how much heat is produced by um, looking at our heat production tables. So, from those tables that are in Albright, go there and look at them, uh, you will see that for pigs, you have 2.4 joules per kilogram per second of total heat produced. So, for a 60 kilogram pig, 2.4 joules per kilogram per second. Uh, so one of the things that you need in order to use this, you need to know the number of pigs and the weight per pig, which I have given you in, in the original statement. But in order to use this, you need to be able to say um, this is joules of energy produced per kilogram of animal per second. So you need to be able to get the per kilogram of animal part. So you need the number of pigs, total number of pigs, and the weight per pig. All right. If you use that and you plug that in, so it's your 2.4 joules per kilogram per second times 60 pigs times 360 pigs, that gives you the total heat production for the entire barn. And then if you plug that back in here, you're going to end up with the amount of CO2 generated is 2.11 liters of CO2 per second or 0 0.0038 kilograms of CO2 per second. Okay. Now we have to um, make a note or an assumption. I always want you to kind of note this in your problems. Uh, assume what is your uh, incoming CO2 concentration. In most problems I'm going to give this to you uh, and if I don't make sure you note what your assumption is. So 345 parts per million and our we're going to control it at let's see CO2 2 so that's really ugly sorry about that. Um, concentration of CO2 in our space which is this 2 which is the same as what's leaving is given in our problem as a maximum of 5,000 parts per million. <coughs> now we're ready to put this into um, 
to, to uh, convert the units that we want so that we can then plug that into our balance equation. This is where that conversion is important. Okay, you need this conversion uh, to get from uh, the amount of CO2 you have to the amount in air so that we're working with a common set of units. Okay. Kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of air. And we need to get into this common set of units. And if you convert the 5,000 parts per million you get 0076 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of air. All right. Now we're ready to plug this into our balance equation and solve it for the amount of air that is needed to maintain these conditions. If we plug it in, we have our um, uh, our generation rate is 0 0.0038 kilograms CO2 per second, and then we have our um, uh, concentration in our space is 0 0.0076 kilograms CO2 per air, and our concentration of our incoming uh, air is 0 0.005241, um, and so kilogram CO2 per kilogram of air. And if we solve this, we end up with 0 0.537 kilograms of air per second. So there you go. Um, that's pretty exciting because this is the first ventilation rate problem that we've solved in this class. So um, if we wanted to maintain a minimum concentration of 5,000 parts per million in our space, we would need an absolute minimum ventilation of 0.537 kilograms of air per second. Um, we will, this, this will conclude this uh, section on uh, comfort and uh, indoor environmental quality. Um, and we will continue on with the next section.